So uh, thank you so, so much for joining, uh, Tina. It's really, really fantastic. I know that uh, we'll probably have a lot of questions from people in the group. So um, what we will do is Tina will start with a little bit of a discussion um, at the beginning with a few slides. I'll be showing the slides. And then afterwards, um, you know, we'll open it up for your questions. And I think Tina has a few questions for you as well. Uh, so uh, we can hopefully establish a little bit of a back and forth. Okay, well, I will now start uh, the slides. All right. Thank you, Allison, for that introduction. And good morning, California. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a little less prepared than I'd like to be because, and my slide formatting is a little bit rough because I just got finished uh, running two workshops that many of you might be interested in. One is still my background. This is the ultra uh, precision control for ultra, uh, ultra, uh, excuse me, ultra efficient devices. Um, that workshop was the second workshop in a series on semiconductor R&D for energy efficiency intended to inform our portfolio of semiconductor research, development, demonstration, and deployment, or RDBND uh, planning. Workshops are one of the major mechanisms that the Advanced Manufacturing Office, or AMO, uses to get formal input on future research direction. But we also use informal methods, and that is part of my purpose here today. I will provide a, a brief history, some background in AMO, and a brief history of atomically precise manufacturing at AMO, and then suggest some future directions that I would like to discuss with you. Uh, along the way, I will get into details of some of our research projects, but I want this to be a dialogue, so please interrupt me with any questions as I go. Next slide, please. So AMO is involved in atomically precise manufacturing because we believe it's an important pathway for energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is our mission. It's the first part of the title of our parent office, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And at AMO, a very busy staff of more than 70 manages a budget of nearly 400 million per year. More than half of this budget goes to RDD and D projects that are targeted high impact investments for next generation materials, process, and energy supply technologies. Next in size, with approximately a third of AMO's budget, are our R and D consortia, including several manufacturing USA institutes that tackle specific technical challenges, like the Power America consortia efforts to deploy wide band gap semiconductors in energy efficient power electronics. Finally, we have a technical partnerships uh, area which provides direct technical assistance to US manufacturers and workers. As we look at new, new uh, and refurbished technical areas for potential investment, we consider whether they're appropriate for projects, consortia, and or partnerships. Next slide, please. Okay, here uh, are some background on the typical manufacturing industries we deal with, as well as our six guiding principles or goals for the AMO. In the past, AMO has focused on reducing the energy intensity of manufacturers themselves, and that is still a top goal, including for atomically precise manufacturing. AMO now has a mandate to partner with manufacturers to make things that are more energy efficient and reduce carbon emissions. And most of the ideas I have for the future of APM, in particular for ultra precision control for ultra energy efficient devices, most strongly support this goal number two, to reduce the life cycle energy and resource impacts of manufactured goods. But as I hope you will see, uh, they also support decarbonization, circular economy, technology transition, workforce, and workforce goals. Next slide, please. Why does AMO care about atomic precision? Um, we began uh, work on atomically precise manufacturing based on a hypothesis that increasing control at the atomic scale is an important pathway to greater energy efficiency and productivity. APM is the next step in a long history of ultra precise manufacturing at ever smaller scales. Of course, precision is not the only consideration, 
as it can trade off with cost throughput and process intensity. AMO explored these trade-offs in our discussions in recent workshops. Rio Taniguchi in 1983 accurately predicted that we would achieve commercial atomic scale accuracy in, uh, in the around 2020, not surprisingly in semiconductor manufacturing. While most of the key manufacturing technical advances being supported at AMO pertain to sort of larger normal manufacturing scales. For example, at the micron scale, recent developments in electron beam powder bed fusion have surpassed the additive manufacturing precision of laser powder bed fusion, but both techniques are an important part of AMO's current metallurgy portfolio. Though LBPF is more widespread and affordable, but electron beam powder bed fusion may turn out to be a key technology for highly conductive materials. AMO's efforts in ultra-precise manufacturing recognize that uh, much of the cutting edge is at the nano or even atomic scale. Semiconductor manufacturing is only one of many applications that will benefit from ultra precision manufacturing, um, but is possibly the application area within uh, the a APM portfolio that is closest to commercialization. Next slide. Here is an outline of my talk which proceeds mainly in historical order. Uh, I understand that my predecessor and the founder of the APM effort at AMO, David Forrest, has spoken to this group before. Uh, and so you may know more about this early history of APM at AMO than I do. So please do not hesitate to chime in. Next slide. Uh, of course, as we all do, one of the first things that David did uh, and this is our tradition, was to hold a workshop on atomically precise manufacturing. I believe and think you will see that this workshop was seminal in the development of the program. I don't know exactly why the workshop report never came out, but by the time I arrived in August of 2019, it seemed to be a little late to publish it. Uh, at that time, I heard a lot of skepticism about the uh, 50 quads of energy savings, uh, as we heard last week from President Biden, we will be trying to cut U.S. carbon emissions 50% by 2030. And if that were done purely through energy efficiency, that would be nearly 50 quads. Next slide. The evolution of David's thinking on APM can also be seen in the variations on the SBIR topic focus. You can see the first topic in 2015 must have been developed in 2014. Um, and at first, APM was a subset of other efforts. Um, and these areas include catalyst membranes, eventually hydrogen depassivation, lithography, molecular machines, and gas separation. By the time David retired, AMO was managing 15 projects in APM, totaling more than 10 million, 10 different companies. Starting in uh, 2015, he funded two companies to, uh, to do work on membranes where atomic precision was desired but not required. One of these companies, Global R&D, recently received a fourth two-year SBIR phase 2D award to commercialize its nano membranes. And one of the applications for these mem membranes is for oxygen generation that would come in very handy right now. The next year with uh, the DOE's Office of Science, Basic Energy Sciences, he funded 11 companies to specifically do uh, work on atomically precise membranes. This proved to be a bit challenging and none of these companies graduated to later stages. Later that year, he went on, he went back to catalysis and one of these companies, Sirenix Renewables, is now considered a success story for the catalyst molecule, detergent molecule it discovered. In FY17, he tried again with membranes and while advances were made, only one company, Ingimat, achieved success. Later in 2017, he returned to a catalyst focus. And again, one company, Fulcrum Biosciences, went on to phase two and will be competing this year for a phase 2B commercialization grant. In FY18 with the ES, he began funding STM lithography research that has become the foundation of our ultra energy efficient semiconductor device work. Also during this time, he began funding higher performance conductor work. 
that resulted in the nano aluminum success story and possibly will become part of the APM portfolio. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I haven't updated this chart past 2018, but I can tell you that APM funding definitely peaked in 2018 with uh, when 10 million in SBIR research was matched by approximately 8 million in funding under the Emerging Research Explorations BOA. When matching funds are considered, the new funding for five projects with seven institutes totals 9.7 million. Next slide. Uh, in addition to the five pro funding for the five projects labeled as atomic precision, in 20, the 2018 ERE FOA had another 2 million for self assembling graphene nanoribbons, which I believe may ultimately become an APM related project. Uh, also, note this slide includes the original categories that David developed for his APM portfolio. Uh, positional, assembly, catalysis, uh, and a, a 3D and 2D positional assembly. But over time, I believe he changed his views on what he considered to be true APM. In particular, the 2D based positional assembly is only partially a top-down approach. It involves what I am now calling uh, guided self-assembly steps for example, where the hydrogen easily passivates the silicon surface on its own. And later when phosphine and other dopant precursor gas deposit themselves on the sites prepared by the scanning tunneling microscope. In fact, we discovered that sometimes ultra doping occurs when dopant atoms attach themselves to the SDM created dangling bonds. Next slide. So uh, one of the six ERE projects with the Zyvex team was to focus on creating and testing atomically precise 2D materials using a scanning tunneling microscope that uh, pulls individual hydrogen atoms out of a surface and then uses a coating procedure to substitute other atoms in their place or dopants. In the process of doing this work, Zyvex learned a lot about how to engineer and image the STM patterning of the silicon much of which is highly relevant to semiconductor manufacturing. As I will describe, this project underpins significant APM advances for applications, including quantum computing and nanoelectronic devices. The chart uh, at the right shows some of the groundbreaking research done by Zyvex sub part, subcontractor NIST on two atom and three by three atomic arrays, the so-called Coulomb diamonds show the energy levels of individual atom, individual electrons are gated through the devices. Next slide, please. The Draper award-winning PI at the University of Texas at Dallas is working to increase the operating speed uh, of molecular assembler microscope tips by a factor of 100 to 1,000 times using high-precision circuit and power engineering and MEMS space microfabrication technologies to advance APM for a wide range of clean energy applications. Next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, you can see here um, the different uh, tips that were used and the different techniques using MEMS. And that's supposed to illustrate that MEMS works just as well as piezoelectric, except it's uh, 10 times faster so far. I haven't quite got to 1,000 times faster. Next slide. Okay, the University of California in Los Angeles. The UCLA team was substantially delayed when their industrial partner was acquired by the Canadian banknote company. Now you may wonder why, but uh, apparently this was viewed as a technology uh, to deposit very small amount atoms on a banknote to uh, prevent fraud. But we believe that this company is now the core of Canada's approximately $200 million atomically precise manufacturing program. Not much information has been released, maybe you know more, but we have learned from vendors that they have ordered several dozens of the Tienta Omicron's low temperature STMs machine that UCLA is developing. It's using to develop uh, atomically sharp tips by using a diamondoid tool to grab and position molecules 
uh, to build atomically precise structures. UCLA's work is probably the lowest TRL effort in the group, but it is clear that three-dimensional control will be a significant advance in atomically precise manufacturing for a wide range of applications. Next slide. Temple University has been designing and synthesizing atomically precise structures using their unique molecular building blocks and software design tools or molecular Lego to create much more energy efficient and higher yield bottom up uh, approach to creating catalysts for polyester production. This bottom up approach also could increase the recyclability of the polyesters and other plastics that now cause ecosystem destroying microplastic pollution. In its first year, Tem Temple already successfully scaled up its spiroligamer building blocks to multi-kilogram scale. So that's probably the most advanced manufacturing technology of the group. Next slide. The Dana-Farber Cancer Institute team in collaboration with its partner, Oxford University, has been funded to build a first of a kind, first generation molecular two-dimensional printer that is itself atomically precise. Um, synthesis of the DNA origami-based nanosystems is massively parallel and the molecular scale of the assemblers enables creation of 10 to the 12th, um, a picomole of products simultaneously. Like other, uh, uh, this project, like several of the other atom, uh, APM projects, uh, were delayed uh, severely by COVID restrictions in both Cambridges. Uh, but now the teams are exploring two different architectures the DFCI stack architecture, including a beast <laughs> and frame sub architectures, and the Oxford wrap architecture which includes a uh, uh, bow and arrow sub-architecture. The frame sub-architecture is shown in the upper right as a schematic, as a computer simulation, and finally as a transmission electron microscope image. Um, note that the experimental data and even the simulation data shown are much more uh, organic looking than the schematic diagram. It's a little hard to see, but on the left is showing uh, well, the DFCI printer arms showing the printer head at uh, multiple printer heads at the top, in the middle, and at the bottom of the printer arm. Next slide, please. So that concludes my review of the uh, 2015 to 2019 um, APM efforts. Um, I'd like to describe now where these six ERE projects are going. As I mentioned, all of them are still active. Uh, most of them would have been completed by now, but most of them have now gotten delayed between six and 12 months due to COVID related delays. Um, but it's now looking pretty much like all of them will be meeting their goals. Uh, and so for each of these six projects, uh, I wanna engage with you on how we're going to try to leverage their accomplishments and expand it some, into some new areas. The first most obvious one to me was to take the work with open sun silicon uh, and turn that into a potential uh, pro program in atomic precision for microelectronics. And I uh, did, like David before me, develop an SBIR topic in that area. Next slide, please. But before I go into the specifics of our planning for microelectronics, I need to explain to you what is now the strongest driver for DOE to focus on semiconductor R&D that many others seem to think should be housed at the Department of Defense, uh, NIST, or NSF based on recent proposals. But with our new mission, AMP, it's clear that DOE and AMO have important contributions to make. Our, in our new mission, we are not only are we to get to a zero carbon grid by 2035, last Thursday, we got another ambitious mandate from the Biden administration, um, which has made DOE the cornerstone of its efforts to combat the climate crisis. I noted before this goal is to reduce in only 10 years, carbon emissions by 
or equivalently energy use by 50 quads. From her first day in office, our secretary has emphasized the DOE's role in making to make science is to make scientific breakthroughs, turn them into technologies, and deploy the technologies in a way that creates good paying jobs, ensures racial justice, and encourages collaboration. Last week, AMO's assistant secretary repeated these themes and linked flattening the curve of semiconductor energy use to addressing the climate crisis. They also talked about the potential for increasing good paying jobs by bringing semiconductor manufacturing back to the US and the need for encouraging collaboration across the government and to bring disadvantaged communities uh, into the climate and ultra energy efficiency challenges. Next slide. We hear regularly from climate scientists about why emissions reduction in the next 10 years is so urgent. But there's another reason we need ultra energy efficiency for semiconductors, uh, even without considering the climate impact. Last week, five speakers, including me, showed some version of this Semiconductor Research Corporation chart about how semiconductor use after energy use, after decades of being fairly negligible, has started to increase exponentially, doubling every three years, 30% a year, um, and could become a significant fraction of planetary energy use in the next decade. This trend, alarming, is not surprising given the confluence of the end of Moore's law efficiency increases and the rapid digitalization and virtualization of our whole modern economy, even absent a climate crisis, we cannot economically afford to let semiconductor energy use become a significant fraction of planetary energy use because SRC projects that uh, this will cause its economic benefits to disappear. But with the climate crisis, we really can't afford to let semiconductors become part of the problem rather than the solution. Note that this is a log chart. So this straight line is an exponential increase. Um, 30% versus uh, en human energy production, which is growing only at 2% a year. Ultra energy efficiency is desperately needed in the coming decade because we really don't wanna reach that market dynamics limit. Next slide, please. As I mentioned at the beginning, we first started expanding our work on APM by writing another SBIR topic, this time called Atomic Precision for Microelectronics. We selected five projects, which are displayed here. Later, we had an open lab, lab call, and lo and behold, two of the projects also were related to atomic precision for microelectronics. Like David, we knew that in order for this portfolio to grow, we would need to hold a workshop. But in addition to the workshops, we got some help from Congress, as well as the Biden administration. When we began our workshop series in January, um, uh, it was right after the enactment of two important laws, the Energy Act of 2020, which specifically authorized AMO to work on smart manufacturing, including sensors and controls and decarbonization, and the CHIPS Act of 2020, which authorized DOD, DOE, and other agencies increase efforts and coordination on semiconductor R&D. After our first workshop in January, the Biden-Harris administration also weighed in strongly on semiconductors with a February executive order, the March Jobs Act, and the April fiscal year 2022 skinny budget request, which included funding for a Manufacturing USA Institute on semiconductors. So do you have any questions uh, at this point now about the current portfolio on this, what, what I call ultra precision for ultra energy efficiency? Perhaps if you do, you can raise your hand here in the um, using the feature. Oh, wait a minute. I see there's two things in the chat. Sorry, I haven't been monitoring the chat. I believe David also funded Covalent, and that has been very successful. Oh, okay. I'd be I'd be like I'd like to hear about uh, co Covalent success. By the time I uh, um, joined the program, they were no longer being funded. C. E3S Center Berkeley, an effort led by UC Berkeley and Eli Yablanovich. And so what is that related to? <clears throat> Your goal of improving energy efficiency of semiconductors. So this oh. is an NSF 
Science and Technology Center. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I learned Lloyd Whitman spoke at our um, mm -hmm. uh, spoke at our uh, workshop last week, and he mentioned that as well. And we we are aware of some of those. Apparently, that's no longer funding uh, projects. Covalent people around the conference, and we'd be happy to talk with you. All right, great. Um, okay, so um, here we have. Uh, just so you know, we have various. We have one more question, in case uh, in case you're okay with it, from Ted, who just raised his hand. Oh, raise his hand. Okay, I, I'm not uh, seeing I, the hand yeah, raising. Yeah, it's it's all we're all learning how to use these uh, you know, re remote um, systems uh, to get people's attention. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I I do remember David Forrest's presentation uh, a few years ago to For Foresight. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of my, my question to you is atomic precision, whether it's the bottom up um, self assembly or top down with the STM tips that, that you mentioned. It's one thing to create a few structure, you know, maybe a dozen atoms or you know, something on a surface. And it's quite another to figure out how to scale that up to some commercial um, size that will you know, help with energy efficiency or materials or climate or you know, whatever. Um, right. I was wondering whether the part of any of the programs that you mentioned whether there's some help or ideas to bridge that gap between you can get the precision, but just with a few atoms, and then actually you know, sort of scale it up in some way to be much, much larger um, sizes. Yeah, well, I was, I, I'm not quite finished with my talk. I just wanted to pause mm -hmm. for questions. But one of the things I was going to talk about is what's happening with um, the, you know, STM based uh, atomically precise manufacturing mm -hmm. is that we've discovered some of the very interesting physics uh, of, uh, such as the ultra doping uh, leads to some uh, very interesting phenomena such as uh, abrupt dopant profiles, which a, an abrupt dopant pro profile is very important for making the tunnel field effect transistor, which has been around for a while, but making it more of a practical uh, idea for energy efficiency. And, and in fact, the tunnel field effect transistor uh, is uh, projected to be about 10 times more efficient, which is sort of the kind of uh, advances we need in order to get to these really ambitious goals in the next 10 years. Um, and our Sandia project is had a, a conference. Actually, I have a bunch of slides on that in my extra slides last week about uh, had a, uh, about uh, how they're working with the chemistry community, the AVS uh, area selective deposition community to figure out uh, how they can use area selective deposition, uh, you know, guided self-assembly is what we're calling it. Cause I'm told that directed self-assembly now means block copolymers. <laughs> so uh, guided self-assembly uh, to, uh, to scale up the atomically precise uh, uh, you know, ultra doped type of, uh, of devices. So that's an example where, and they've done some testing and it looks like they're, they are going to be able to uh, use uh, a, a tom ASD, <laughs> area selective deposition. I keep thinking the A is for atomic um, as, as a way to manufacture these uh, atomically precise uh, vertical uh, tunnel field effect transistors. You know, they, they had to experiment with the, uh, the geometry. Uh, the fact that it's a vertical uh, transistor means that it's less sensitive to uh, it, it, the fact that uh, area selective deposition de is precise in the, in the vertical dimension is very useful for that. I just saw a whole bunch of questions come in. Um, should I try to answer them now? Uh, As you prefer. Let me, let me just take Thank a look. You. Um, let's we have see. Matthew Ryder and I think uh, Tom again. I think Tom ultra low K dielectric materials be of interest, especially materials where electronic properties can be modified and controlled with the main. Yeah, we actually talked about ultra low K dielectric materials and how that was one of the ways that uh, you know we that they dealt with the end of Moore's law for certain applications. Um, and so I think that's definitely an area of interest. I believe this could be a fruitful extension of semiconductor focus. Okay, good, good. Okay, we'll talk about that 
Um, there's plenty of room in the middle combining top down with bottom up. Yes, that was a major result uh, at our workshop last week that, you know, that what we need to do, uh, I think what the, the comment was made that we want to do as much bottom up, let nature do the work on the self assembly as possible because uh, the top down aspect requires uh, fighting entropy so much, <laughs> you know, when you're trying to be atomically precise, uh, nature wants to be uh, increase its entropy. Okay, Steve better. Key aspect, bottom up. Uh, oh, well, that's um, part of the reason that we renamed uh, our semiconductor efforts ultra precision instead of atomic precision is precisely this, that we didn't want, like, because I think a really strict definition, by a really strict definition of atomically precise manufacturing, the only project in our portfolio that really meets that uh, description is the, um, the only project is the UCLA 3D uh, diamondoid tool SPM chip sharpening project. I think all of the other ones involve some type of self-assembly. And that's, but what we're learning is that by doing it in the top-down uh, controlled way that we can learn about some interesting science that we can then use another technique to scale up. And I think that's what people miss. It's, it's really worth it to strive for the atomic precision, even if ultimately the atomic you know, the top-down atomically precise way of manufacturing isn't going to be scalable unless, you know, you're doing some really uh, small scale application like uh, quantum science. Okay. Well, that's it for now. Okay, great. Um, and just so you know, there's a lot more information on all of these projects besides what's on this slide uh, at the very end of, of my uh, presentation. Okay. Let's see here. So can you give me the next slide, please, Allison? Okay, I just wanna I just wanna brag a little <laughs> on our APM portfolio for semiconductors. Uh, I put out this SBIR saying uh, what we want is atomic precision for energy efficiency. We didn't say anything about you know high performance or speed or you know what you know beyond Moore's law, we didn't say anything. All we said was ultra precision and energy efficiency. And it just turns out that our current microelectronics portfolio that we got underpins uh, the IEEE's international roadmap on devices and systems came out at about the same time as our PI meeting. And it turns out that our manufacturing technologies that we're supporting underpin almost all of the most promising new device types. So it, it just somehow by aiming at energy efficiency, we ended up uh, getting things that other people thought were promising for other reasons. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, conclusion. Next slide, please. Okay, another thing we discovered when, when aiming at atomic precision is that uh, not only manufacturing, but metrology could be greatly improved. Um, our PI on the UT Dallas project that I'm showing here, Rezimo Hamani, just won the ASME Charles Draper Award for his work on microelectromechanical systems and other instrumentation control. And when I first started managing this project, Reza was, his name was familiar because he was the guy who solved the STM crashing project, which is the bane of STM researchers. Uh, at our recent workshop last week on ultra precise control, he led the metrology session with his spectacular results on increasing the signal to noise ratio for STM signals, um, as well as the first, second, and third deriv derivative of the signals. And that's the image on the left. On the left, you can see conventional imaging. And on the right, you can see soup-up MEMS imaging. Um, and you can see, uh, especially uh, when you get to the third derivative, I mean, the first derivative, uh, it goes uh, signal, first derivative, second derivative, third derivative. You see all sorts of details on the right that you just simply don't see on the left. Uh, another thing that was enabled by his STM feedback control loop 
is really a, a crude mo new mode of lithography. Now he is able to um, image individual atoms and at the same time remove them from the hydrogen terminated silicon surface. And this chart on the right shows, you can see an X where he removed an X and on the, on the right of the image shows the little steps where each electron is removed. So I think that's pretty spectacular. Uh, and just to brag a little more, um, <clears throat> he managed to crank out all sorts of peer reviewed papers uh, in journals and uh, was awarded a total of four patents with two more pending for this technology. So I think this research is well on its way to having a commercial impact. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the University of California, Los Angeles project um, got delayed because they lost their, uh, their industrial partner to Canada. <laughs> Uh, and then of course they had LA County, city and university lockdowns. But still they've created and verified one diamondoid tool that, and that's that, that little construct there that can abstract an atom from an SPM tip um, triggered by uh, UV light. Uh, I uh, think they will develop they're planning to develop two more such tools and do more work on modeling before their project ends in December. So stay tuned for, I think they're gonna try to get a science or nature paper in this. Um, and I think again, this comes closest to David's vision of a molecular machine. Um, and one of the exciting things about this is this project will benefit greatly from the 100 to 1000 times speed up of the atomic force microscope and scanning tunneling microscope tips from the MEMS and other uh, advances of UT Dallas. Another thing about this project is this took a whole lot of chemistry, experimentation and modeling. So as a physicist, I confess, it's the one I have the least background in, uh, but uh, the PI was at our semiconductor energy efficiency workshop. And uh, I am quite sure they will use their chemistry breakthroughs in helping us understand how surface chemistry um, can uh, their mechanosynthesis results will help them have insights into surface chemistry that will help with the scale up of semiconductor technologies and other technologies where an understanding of surface chemistry was identified as a need. Next slide. Speaking of chemistry, uh, I guess Chris Schaffmeister's molecular Lego project is going great guns, but He's now using the kilograms of spiroligomer building blocks that he synthesized for AMO in a DOD funding project. Um, so even though Temple itself was locked down in Philadelphia for much of last year, he was able to, he had an exemption for his DOD funded project that he believes may ultimately help develop a very low cost COVID sensor and other super secret DOD things. Um, and DOD, uh, project, which was, I think, like $11 million or something. Uh, as part of that, they bought him a bunch of robotic equipment for automation, and he was permitted by DOD to use the automated synthesis and purification at his company to accelerate work on the research. So he's caught up by at least six months, uh, even though it was totally stopped. Uh, with the robotic synthesis, he can now synthesize and purify 12 spiroligamers a day which is two orders of magnitude faster than he was able to do in the past 20 years. So he's mostly caught up and reports that he has made um, 360 highly functionalized spiral ligamers using his two robotic synthesizers um, and is on his way to create selective polyester forming mic macromolecular catalysts. Uh, and he's been synthesizing I don't know how to pronounce this, FMOC protected benzofuran displaying building blocks. Next slide. Finally, we get to the management the project that my management has the hardest time understanding why it should be part of AMO. And I apologize for the formatting glitches and the very tiny font. Um, uh, but I think that this is really exciting as a potential next generation manufacturing technology 
because it's a digital manufacturing based on quaternary logic, Watson Crick base pairing instead of binary. Um, but in order to link it to AMO's goals, I need help in getting quantitative data. And so if any of you have any suggestions on this, I, I think you guys got a talk from uh, my DNA origami PI, William Shi. Um, but I'm specifically- I'm talking next, next month. Oh, next month. Okay, well yeah. maybe, um, you know. okay. Well, I guess stay tuned, but um, I'm trying to figure out how an AMO effort in this area could support those six goals. For example, improving productivity, competitiveness, energy efficiency. Um, I think this could be, DNA, uh, the US has an undisputed lead in biotech, all sorts of students and people, there's all sorts of biotech expert people with that kind of education. And uh, I can't, it's, it would be really neat to try to marry some of that expertise to help save energy and energy intensive manufacturing. Uh, especially as we're decarbonizing and transitioning to lower energy electric based processes. Uh, another ammo goal is to reduce the life cycle energy and resource impacts. Uh, and so to me, the programmable DNA approach might be a way to achieve the sort of mass customization that we need to get energy efficiency benefits with products optimized to specific applications. Next slide. Uh, another goal is to really leverage domestic energy resources and materials, uh, maybe enabling rapid prototyping and recyclability design could help. They're uh, transitioning DOE supported innovative technologies, very doable. I mean, Dino Origami is already commercial. Apparently it's all, all the software is online. You can just, you know, come up with a drawing and order it and the DNA Origami arrives. So who knows what could happen if we had DNA programmable assembly set up like that. Strengthening and advancing the workforce seems straightforward um, as uh, the, one of the most diverse and fastest growing STEM uh, groups of sort of biochemically educated people uh, would be great to bring into the manufacturing resource. Um, and this technology can be used by those with just bachelor level training. Um, and finally, our goal number six, to accelerate emerging and transformative technologies to approach net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the industrial sector by 2050. Um, again, uh, I, I don't know where to begin, but there's gotta be some, uh, I know people are talking about uh, direct reduction of iron to make steel electrolytically, uh, just thinking about what are ways that we could use electric control, chemical control, as opposed to you know huge amounts of process energy. Next slide. Uh, so finally, I'm talk I'm going to talk about the sixth project in the emerging research explorations on metal nanocarbon, because that might turn out to be the project where AMO can really show its leadership on atomically precise manufacturing, even though that particular project was not designated as an APM project. Um, and the reason is, I'm not sure you can see this, but uh, I have the word cable, which stands for conductivity enhanced materials for affordable breakthrough leapfrog electric and thermal applications. Um, and that is a dual meaning. It literally stands for electricity, uh, the, the, uh, an electricity transmission cable. That was the first application we thought of when we conceived of a big idea about conductivity enhanced materials. Uh, and this idea was inspired by AMO's previous research on metal enhanced with nanocarbon, which means um, metal which contains small amounts of carbon nanotubes, single or few layer graphene, doped or undoped, or other carbon allotropes. But as the 20 member cable team that I organized around this talk more, it became clear that we should also explore other categories of materials, such as metal enhanced without nanocarbon, uh, either through processing or with rare earths or other compounds. Um, the, and these can be alloys or metal matrix composites. And finally, there's the really exciting category of non-metal 
which can be enhanced with metal nanoparticles. Uh, and these can be uh, a, a polymer with silver nanoparticles or nanocarbon, um, but not bulk metal. Um, and so we conceived of this idea to have an initiative in enhanced conductivity materials. And we felt like that based on our experience with the uh, nanocarbon research, we had several things we wanted to do in terms of verifying and validating uh, that we felt needed to be done, apples to apples comparisons made, but we just couldn't agree on whether this material was basically ready to go and just needed validation or whether more research is needed. And after our cable workshop earlier this month, I think more research is needed. Uh, but we, the research we do have is already yielding some fascinating results. Um, we inspired uh, a theorist at Argonne National Lab to do atomistic modeling of copper carbon allotropes. And can you guys see, is, is the uh, animation playing? Is there a way you can get that animation to play? Oh, look at that. You can see that theorists are looking at 500 atoms and exploring and calculating the energies of all these different things. And if you click on the one below it, uh, they're doing the same things. They're doing the same things for carbon nanotubes, just looking at all the configurations. And so what, so what we've kind of come full circle is here's something where it started off as sort of a metallurgy project realizing that it probably is going to take an understanding and possibly atomic control. It, it, there's probably there's some uh, self-assembly thing going on here with the carbon allotropes uh, that is leading to this conductivity enhancement. And so ironically, um, you know, higher conductivity metal is definitely an AMO space. And so that's, that's sort of the end of my talk about future directions uh, for atomically precise manufacturing at AMO. And I guess I'd like to answer some more questions and engage in a dialogue. Uh, is cable, hang on, where did it go? I just flashed on. Is cable what used to be called Covetics? Um, yeah, the, it was the Covetics. Oh, there's William. Um, the Covetics is, uh, was the research program uh, that I took over and had it reviewed, and that was what led to the idea for the cable initiative. Uh, I was the director of R&D at TMM, which made composed. We should talk. Yes, I agree. Steve better. Okay, so now I'm going backwards. German company commercializing DNA origami. So, um, Allison, is there a way that you that uh, that you can Reco record all of these great chats I'm getting in URLs? I'll certainly do so. Yes, I'll send you the, the entire chat. Okay, that's great. Because uh, I'm, I'm certainly not going to remember all of these URLs. Um, German company, commercially, yeah, that's great. Um, that's my understanding is that these are commercial. I, when I went up to Doc, uh, to William Shee's office, uh, he may remember that I I, I took my camera and took pictures of the shipping cart that, that some of his pieces uh, of stuff arrived from because it looked so totally commercial that this is, uh, uh, you know, this is definitely a manufacturable thing. So even though the other people at AMO thought DNA origami is some like really far out futuristic thing, uh, the pictures of the boxes where you can order your stuff really made the point that this is, uh, <laughs> This is here now, and it's just not something that AMO is used to. Uh, okay. Uh, um, this is just a reminder to anyone who has questions or comments uh, to do that via hand raising or to say that in the chat directly. And um, I think, Tina, you also mentioned you had a few things that you wanted to get feedback on, plus a few more slides to show in case I should bring any of it up. Okay. Um, yeah, why don't we just... Quickly, uh, there was another comment, comment uh, about covalent technologies. It sounds like it is a stronger criteria now. Yes, I think it's fair to say that the previous administration didn't really care that much about CO emissions directions, uh, but it's it's now like the whole central purpose of, of DOE. So it's definitely changed in terms of a metric. Yeah, why don't we just take a quick flash through some of the rest of my um, slides 
Uh, yeah, I will just leave questions in in case they come up and then I may have, oh, there's another one from Matthew Wright just as we talk about it. And I'll bring yeah, it up. Yeah. yeah, why don't you uh, just, okay, so I'll just, I'll just flash through some of the other, you know, highlights quickly. Okay, so sort of in reverse order, um, there's a couple slides about the cable big idea, how we're actually running it with the prize and small business innovation research. And the SBIR is going to be announced May 17th. So very fine. Uh, the next slide 29 is information on the prize. It's $4.5 million over three years. And the prizes increase in size as we go up in stages. The three stages, really only stage one is, is sort of cast, so to speak. Uh, stage two and three, we can modify them. Uh, we're thinking somehow of making some requirements for including uh, and atomistic simulations and something like that. Uh, but our original idea was that people would send us their samples and we would have them tested at three different labs to make sure we were uh, tested, you know, that we were really checking the results and doing apples to apples comparisons. Um, slide 31 is a slide on Sandia's, they call it big energy efficient transistor. And it's about the vertical tunnel field effect transistor made using atomically precise manufacturing. Uh, and they use um, molecular beam epitaxy and uh, uh, CVD vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition. And um, the ultra energy efficiency is from a study from the IRDS uh, 2020 is where we got the 10X energy efficiency. Uh, uh, here's one of the SBIRs we have from Cybex, 3DET and Sandia, about making uh, bipolar junction transistors. Um, next is the dopant metrology uh, project, which is also a good failure analysis tool. And it was able to image simultaneously uh, the dopant placement during fabrication and it shows that phos phosphorus dopants as well as boron dopants uh, can both be imaged. Uh, next slide. Okay, we also have an ALD project with RMD incorporated and they have looked at some very interesting chemistries both for phase change uh, memories and for spin transfer torque devices, memories, base memories. Next slide. We have a project with uh, Carbon Tech uh, a company called Carbon Tech, uh, and they're doing atomic precision manufacturing of carbon nanotube pets, uh, and they're getting some really great results uh, on diameter, and they've been able to purify them, get 97% metallic uh, carbon nanotubes, which is what a lot of people were demanding at the uh, <laughs> table workshop, and uh, there's also their chart on why C and T FETs will transform uh, RF applications. Uh, and finally, uh, our seventh project is the SLAC uh, project that's using synchrotron light source as well as ALD flash annealing and is working on a uh, ferroelectric memory um, and is also using machine learning to figure out how to design and optimize the process. Um, the next slide is a workshop that you all should be interested in called Workshop on Atomic Precision <laughs> last week. And then the three slides following are is my, is, uh, my some, these are my notes uh, that we talked about um, showing about the, uh, one of the great results is that Sandia has showed that the, the atomically precise parts of their TFET are more stable than the metal parts because people always worry about new processes not being durable. Um, they talked about fabrication, uh, ALD, ALE, ASD. Um, and this was where I heard a lot of uh, top down having a ton of entropy to conquer and that self limited bottom up approaches are really the future, but you still are always gonna need some kind of guiding top down. Uh, and then characterization and how hard it is, a lot of discussion of the great things you can do with synchrotron light sources. Uh, another slide showing the people on the ERE teams and technologies. And finally, uh, just one way of displaying my APM portfolio in terms of end unit complexity and array precision. And look, it's three o'clock. So does that mean we turn off, we're done?
Hello? I'm still muted. Hi. Yes. Well, uh, if in case, I mean, I don't know how much time you have, but uh, at least as a question, I think for the group, what would be useful is that, you know, given that there's lots of researchers in the group, you know, who are seeking to make uh, their discoveries applicable, what do you think are really promising areas that, you know, you would like to draw more attention to? I know you've mentioned a ton that you're already funding, but, you know, if you could just, you know, make a like a, a, a quick bucket list or a few key points of areas that, you know, where you think it would be really promising to push for progress now, that would be, I think, super helpful. Well, I, I think, you know, this whole uh, decarbonization is make, taking uh, processes that use fossil fuels, depend on them, and making them into very, you know, low energy uh, electric powered or maybe chemical powered processes uh, is a generally a really important area. I really, I love the even though I'm not a biology person, I really love DNA origami and I really hope that, you know, it gets more support as a manufacturing technology because I think it would be fabulous for that. Um, I see here, Matthew Ryder talked about uh, molecular precision for carbon capture and low energy release. Yeah, that's interesting because, um, uh, you know, we have like turf battles at DOE. I know it's hard to imagine, but it does happen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Office of Fossil Energy is usually the office that uh, talks about uh, carbon capture. And uh, it's interesting because their view of carbon capture is sort of a, an end of pipe view. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out ways to, you know, you know, not emit the carbon in the first place or somehow capture it as part of a side process that you're going on. Uh, low energy release. Well, low energy. I'm not sure exactly. Is Matt is, is Matt still on? Can you tell I me? Think, what I think he had to balance, but he was uh, really like uh, very very excited. I think about the presentation. Would love to follow up by email. Oh yeah, I would love people to to follow up. I always get nervous when I present, so maybe I, I I'm not as clever as as I otherwise would be in my responses to the questions. Well, but, I think uh, uh, people thought it was tremendously useful. Actually, like um, would you could you point people to um, good uh, locations where if they want to find out more uh, more information or if they just want to stay up to date is there for example Isaac you know like he they have a, a newsletter that always uh, shares funding opportunities regularly and so on and so forth so is there like a specific oh that's a really good point I didn't put my email address on my presentation so I'll stick that into the chat uh, and I did have some URLs uh, on the slides uh, the APM portfolio is my first year at AMO. I used the nanotechnology day, you know, October 9th, get it, 10-9. <laughs> I used nanotechnology day as an excuse to uh, highlight, uh, I, to get all my APM uh, project PIs to finish their fact sheets. So all of our, so there's like these two page fact sheets on every single one of our APM project. So you can learn more from those fact sheets. Uh, and they're uh, at, at, at the slide that I showed with the six projects on it, the URL is there. Or you can just search uh, AMO Nanotechnology Day and you'll find uh, our 2019 and 2020 Nanotechnology Day presentations. And the 2019 is on APM and the 2020 is uh, on my other parts of my portfolio and also other parts of AMO that, that do nano. We have nanocrystalline metals research, for example, and we have nanocellulosic uh, fiber research that is not in my portfolio that I did not describe, but some of that's also on our website. Um, the cable, oh, I even typed my name wrong. It's Kars Berg. I'm sorry, I'm a bad typist. I will, I will follow up with, with yeah. that. I'll make sure to get that slide. The V is right next to the V. So anyway, uh. that's lovely. And are there any uh, future workshops? Because you know, Foresight usually what we did before the pandemic hit and we moved everything into a more regular online container. We used to have twice a year technical competitions where people would get thrown together to uh, use APM to solve either uh, health, like challenges in, in health and medicine, or in uh, climate, particularly energy or carbon removal. And so we used to run those uh, like similar workshops, I guess. And so I'm wondering, are there any particular workshops that you know you think could be of interest to people in this group or like particular well, kind of events? Well, the that... cable workshop we just did is all online. And I, I think you can access all the presentations 
here I'll put the URL in there. So it's uh, hope I type it right. Cable dash big idea. I have to make URLs easy so I can remember them. Uh, uh, there, cable. I checked it this time. If you go to there, you can find all about cable. Um, the uh, semiconductor workshop series uh, is uh, is also has a website, but we because we had people from a lot of companies, they didn't want us to uh, put up their presentations, you know, because you know competitiveness and stuff. And uh, so we just have sort of a summary up there. Semi. Conduct. And we are going to have a third workshop on uh, energy efficiency for semiconductors, um, probably in the fall. And, you know, we've learned a lot about virtual workshops, and you can do things with virtual workshops that you, you can't do with in-person workshops. We had a lot of facilitated discussions where people are inputting data and they can do it anonymously. So people, like, sometimes are more free with their opinions than they might otherwise be. <laughs> Totally. Um, we couldn't do this whole uh, entire thing if it wasn't for virtual because we could never, you know, hope to have people like you uh, just yeah. a of here, like an hour uh, here and there. So thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And another thing I learned is that we had a very successful session where we did sort of a, we call it a, a to use a sports metaphor, we called it sort of our statistics person and our color commentary. And so we had readouts from the sessions where we had two people and one person kind of gave the boring dry statistics and the other person did the color commentary. And that proved to be a very fun, uh, a, a very fun way to uh, try to get uh, our uh, people engaged and interested. But uh, yeah, we, we've been doing virtual workshops and we have, we've had like, you know, more than 300 people sign up and, uh, maybe 200, 250 people show up and, and maybe like 150 show up at a time and maybe 20 are really interactive. So that's sort of based on a sample of three. That's, <laughs> that's my observation about the sort of dynamics uh, of these virtual workshops. Yeah, um, that's true. But you have a broader reach as well. So that's, I think that, that's- Yeah, awesome. people, uh, that is one of the nice things about working for the government is that people tend to listen. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, uh, follow up, you know, send me the chat and I'll check out some of the URLs. And if people want to email me at the correct, <laughs> I can't believe I typed my own email wrong, at the correct email address, uh, that would be wonderful. I mean, that was my whole goal in coming here and talking to you all was to start a conversation. And I love people's, one of the things I'm curious about is this idea that cable is really could potentially be a, an atomically precise, turn into an atomically precise thing. That's actually a relatively new thought I had just in the last couple of weeks. So I don't know if it's like totally crazy or not, but I mean, the, the thought of atomic precision being relevant to something like metallurgy, you know, it seems, you know, to be something, uh, I, but I know David talked a lot about defects and, and all of that and strength. So may, maybe that's important after all. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would be cool to do an exploratory meeting on that. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I uh, will definitely be in touch. I think, you know, that you, you, I think you initiated a lot of food for thought in this group and we'll definitely uh, um, try to um, pick, pick, a piece, pick apart the pieces. I am sharing another reminder to apply or nominate someone for our Feynman Prize. And William Shi, who will be presenting and uh, was doing DNA origami, actually uh, was awarded that prize uh, recently. So oh, it's a nice uh, segue into this. <laughs> so please uh, and nominate someone for that prize um, uh, or, or apply yourself. And uh, we'll give it out later this year. Um, and with that, without further ado, I just want to really thank you. Uh, you don't mind me being potentially in contact uh, later to follow up with what we get from the group in terms of feedback. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your time. I'll be opening breakout rooms for those of you who should, you know, want to de debrief and, uh, and decompress and, uh, and discuss. So in a second, you'll be, um, you, you'll, you'll see breakout rooms opening. This is a very informal part, you know, feel free to introduce yourself, say, uh, you know, what your, what your focus area is, uh, and then perhaps, you know, what, what you took away from this talk, just to kind of end it on a, 
uh, on a nice note for people um, to get to know others in the group. So thank you, Tina, from uh, from all of us. It was really, really fantastic. Thanks for joining very much. Okay. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. So long. <laughs>